Um, this group is a little bit bigger than the, uh, than the second year group that I did this with. And so I'm going to stop right there because otherwise we're going to keep doing inter introductions and, until um, my time is in, ended. Um, but I, I do want to I would love to get to know all of you. I wish we had time to do that. Um, but I want to introduce myself. My name, my name is Justin Clement and I, I'm the RUF campus minister at the University of Georgia in Athens. We've been there five and a half years. And we love it. I'm, I'm married. I have three kids. I wish I could like cue like a picture of all of them. They're, they're fabulous. They asked me to take pictures of all the snow and I totally blew it. Now it's all melted. Um, but uh, so we've been in Athens for five and a half years. And then prior to that, um, I started RUF at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. And then before that, um, I was the assistant pastor for youth and college at the church there in San Antonio. Um, before that, I went to Covenant Seminary in St. Louis. And um, excited about Covenant Seminary, all right. And, uh, and then before Covenant Seminary, I went to Samford University, not Stanford, Samford in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, the funny story about that, <clears throat> when I was in high school, my friend um, got into Johns Hopkins and his parents were very focused on academics and diligence and we were, I was on the golf course with his dad, and he's like, well, Justin, you know, uh, where'd you get into school? And I said, I got into Samford. And like the rest of the day, he's like, oh, man, I'm just so proud of you. Like, it's so excited for you. Like, you're, ah, we just love you. That's great. And then like, and then my friend comes over, dad, he didn't get into Stanford. He got into Samford. And he goes, oh. <laughs> it's like, Samford's pretty good, too. Like, it's a pretty good school. So... Um, <laughs> But I went to Samford in college, and I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, I grew up, um, I did not grow up around any of the stuff that we're talking today. A lot of this stuff was things that I picked up um, in seminary, and, um, and then since then. So I, I grew up in an evangelical home. I'm very thankful for my parents. My parents still live in the same home in Memphis that I grew up in, the same huge massive mega church in memphis and um i'm thankful that they're christians and they told me about jesus and the bible and um while they're not uh, we're not a part of the same denomination they are very supportive and encouraging uh, in what we're doing at the university of georgia so i'm really grateful for the way that i grew up um and uh, i'm just i'm really honored to be here i'm i'm, I'm very thankful as i shared earlier I, i've spent four or five hours now with the, with the second year crew, guys and gals. And it, just, it, it was just a, another good reminder for me that your ministry to junior high and high school students is so critical. And I, I'm, I'm speaking to you as someone who's a college pastor, a campus minister, because so many times I find the students, the lights turn on when they're away from mom and dad in college. You know, they actually begin to try on their faith, you know, you know, kind of make their faith their own. And 90% of the time, it's going back to what y'all said. Going back to that late night conversation. Going back to that retreat. And the seeds that you, that you have sown, you know, for the gospel. Um, I'm thankful. Your work is hard and difficult. And many times you don't see the fruit during your tenure at your church. And I just want you to know that I'm grateful. And I'm here to be an encouragement to you. Um, the things that we're talking about, and I know that Buck, Buck Rogers is a, is a dear friend of mine. I know he would agree with this. Like, Our philosophy of ministry is not the right way to do ministry. There's a whole lot of great models for ministry. We are not suggesting, many of you have been doing ministry longer than I have. We're not suggesting this is the only way to do ministry, this is the right way. What we are saying is we found this to be a helpful way. The Lord has, has, has faithfully um, bore fruit through this model. Um, it's, it's obviously not holy writ. It's a model. But um, humbly, graciously, we want to 
put it before you and invite you to wrestle with it and consider what it might look like to implement this model of ministry in your context. Um, first year training, um, whether you're working with youth, whether you're working with college students, is like drinking from a fire hose. Um, Buck is brilliant. I love Buck. But he did like the whole overview in like an, two hours. Is that right? The whole philosophy of ministry overview. I mean, it takes four or five years of really wrestling with the principles and the presuppositions and the goals in your unique context, understanding yourself and who you are in your own skin and how much of like you in ministry is bravado and insecurity and how much of it is actually you. All of that stuff, it takes years to begin to sort of figure out how all that works. So I just want to invite you... Um, it, it, it's okay if, if this feels overwhelming, if it feels confusing, if it's like, Justin, I want to leave this place with practical one, two, three steps. Unfortunately, I, I don't know. I don't know that you're, you're going to be able to walk away with those, but hopefully you will be encouraged. Hopefully you'll be given a lot of good things to kick around with your staff back in your hometown and um, to really, and really think through. So I've been asked... Um, if you have any questions, by the way, I've just put my email address up here. Unfortunately, my time is limited, so as soon as we, I, I finish this section, or our session together, I'm going to have to race and drive back to Athens. But, it, but um, I will leave time at the end of, of my lecture for questions. Um, but if for some reason I don't get to your question or, or something comes up next week, um, please email me. I'll be glad, to, be glad to help you out in any way I can. Um, so I'm talking about a very, very important part of our philosophy of ministry that we just call the principles. And um, I couldn't be happier, I couldn't be more honored to share this with you because in many ways, this is the heart and soul, this is the guts, this is the rocket fuel that drives everything that we do in our philosophy of ministry. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance for my drawings. It's okay, right? It's a safe place, safe place to make bad drawings. I'm going to refer to this image a lot, and it's just simply a rocket ship. And if, if you think about our purpose in RUF or RYM, which is uh, to reach and equip, right? We want them to, people to become Christians, and we want them to grow in their faith. We want evangelism. We want discipleship. We don't just want people to... To be saved, we want them to really be mature and be able to use their callings. And if the, um, I don't know if you guys can see this. Yeah, so the, the purpose is the top of the rocket ship. The, um, right, right in here, the rocket fuel. These, this is our principles. Why am I telling you this? Because you can have an amazingly crafted purpose statement. You could have all these tangible, concrete goals that you've un unveiled to the parents of the youth group and the, the session and all that kind of good stuff. But nothing is going to get that rocket off the launch pad unless it's the gospel. So in, the, in a sense, for the next couple of hours, I'm talking about the gospel. Our principles are our gospel distinctives, the fuel in our tank that allows and makes ministry happen. And <clears throat> that means practically every single thing that you do in your ministry, every decision, how you craft your like uh, small group questions on a retreat to um, how you do your, your talking points in a sermon or, or a, a talk in um, what kind of speaker you're going to invite to come in for a retreat, whether you go on a mission trip or not go on a mission trip. Every decision is ultimately being driven by these principles. And these principles are scripture, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Scripture, justification, sanctification, and glorification. And I'm going to um, unpack those um, as we go. Now, if you're thinking about this, you're like, okay, those are good things. Scripture is our final authority. We think that the Bible is a good thing and our only rule for faith and practice. Yes, 
justification. Like that's that whole thing about God fully forgiving us and also declaring us as righteous. Like that, yeah, that's true. Like I'm really okay because of the righteousness of Christ and, and him bearing my punishment on the cross. Sanctification, I can really grow and change because the Holy Spirit is at work in my life, changing me. Glorification, my life matters that one day Jesus is coming back and the presence of sin will be gone. You know, we will have resurrected bodies. We will reign with Jesus on a resurrected creation. New heavens and new earth. Okay, those are good things. Why those? Are you saying that other things don't matter? What about things like the kingdom of God? What about things like um, union with Christ? What about things like regeneration? What about things like just this amazing word redemption? Like there's all, the Bible talks about a lot of different things. Are you saying that in our ministries, we only need to talk about those four things? Absolutely not. That's called being reductionistic. This philosophy of ministry, we, we do not want to have reduc reductionistic ministries. But we also want to be very practical. You're working with youth, junior high and high school students. I'm working with college students around the clock. I only have three to four years with a student. And if like... I have a, that short of amount of time, what am I aiming at? All of it's important. All of, the whole counsel of God is important, but what am I going to be focusing on? So think about our principles not as like the only thing you talk about in ministry. Think about it as the middle of the dartboard. You're aiming for that every time in one-on-ones, small groups, large group, retreats, everything that you're doing. And as you hit those principles, you're going to be talking about those other areas. Like, let's say you're, you're speaking on John chapter 3. The classic passage about Nicodemus, you must be born again. Um, regeneration might be coming up in that conversation. But you're still going to be talking about the, the fact, how can I be right with God? Right? I mean, isn't that what Nicodemus was asking? Um, let's say that... Um, Another example, let's say that the, there's a passage that you're, that you're teaching on or you're writing a Bible study for that's making much of this idea of redemption, that, that this amazing term where, where, where um, God buys us back from captivity and bondage. He ransoms us. He pays the bounty on our head with his precious blood to bring us into his family. Absolutely, you're going to talk about redemption as the mechanism that allows us to be right with God. See how these are connected? So we're, not, so we're not reducing everything down to only talking about those four things, but that is what we're aiming for in the lives of all of our students. So let's talk specifically about Scripture for a moment. Well, before I go into that, I'll tell you what, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Just by way of reminder, I'm, I don't know if Buck shared this with you or not. I'm kind of a big picture guy, so like seeing where everything's going is helpful for me. And when we're talking, notice where philosophy of ministry is within this diagram here. The Bible is our foundation. It is, it is absolutely our standard. It is authoritative, inspired, infallible. And then on top of the Bible, everyone is a theologian. The sixth grade girl in your junior high ministry is a theologian. We are all theologians. We all come to conclusions about who God is. And so based upon the Bible, we come to theological conclusions. If you're a member of, uh, for example, my denomination, the PCA, we have a theological statement called the Westminster Confession of Faith, the larger and shorter catechism. What we're basically saying is not that the confession of faith is the same level as the Bible. We're saying that is a good summary of what the Bible principally teaches. Now, many people might be asking, well, if we have the Bible and we have theology, why do we need a philosophy of ministry? Because the philosophy of ministry question answers, how are you going to carry your theological dis distinctives into the lives of junior high and high school students. All of us have a philosophy of ministry. All of us have a way of carrying those distinctives, but what is it? So we found it's helpful to articulate that, 
to lay it out, to think about it so that we can ask reflective questions. Some of you mentioned about having common language. It makes it easy for staff to talk about goals and initiatives and um, to even assess how things are going because everyone has the same definitions for things. This also explains why, as I mentioned, I'm a part of the Presbyterian Church in America. We have, all of us as ministers have to take vows to hold the same theological viewpoint. But here's the deal. This is crazy. There are many, many different types of PCA churches that all hold the same theological distinctives. Well, where does that come from? We don't have a common philosophy of ministry. And so that's where, so, so that, that's, the philosophy of ministry question is getting at, what is it going to look like for me to carry my, the, the truths that I believe about God into the lives of junior high and high school students? And then, of course, your methods are simply your, your decisions. Are you going to go on a mission trip or not? Are you, going to, are you going to scrap Sunday school and just do community groups? Or are you going to go in a different direction? Those are methodological decisions, and you're not going to be able to answer those questions unless you first go through the philosophy of ministry questions. Does that make sense? Have you all seen that before? Okay, good. Um, all right, let's talk about Scripture for just a couple of minutes here. Second Timothy three seven uh, three fourteen through seventeen is something I'd like to read to you. Paul writes, "But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture." is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. <laughs> when we are saying that Scripture is one of our principles that's on the forefront of our mind, that is ultimately getting to the question of authority. Let me unpack that a bit more. You might have um, a, a couple of students in your youth group who have grown up in the church their whole lives. Perhaps their, their, um, their parents are leaders in the church. They know the, the catechism. They, they've committed a lot of scripture to memory. Um, in fact, they give you all of the right answers. And then when you actually spend time with them and talk about real life, they have another functional authority that is calling the shots in their life. It could be a coach. It could be their parents. It could be um, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. It could be a teacher. And what we're getting at with Scripture being our final authority is we are inviting our students to consider and ask the question, what really is the final authority in your life? Is it your feelings? Is it what he thinks about you? Is it what she thinks about you? And we want to ultimately move them toward and woo them and persuade them and convince them that Jesus really is enough for you. That his word is sweet. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from my father. Um... Notice that distinction I made. It's very easy to have students in our groups that can give the right answers and we can very easily check them off and go to the next student who appears to have a really um, important issue. But we have to dig a little bit deeper and ask those questions. What is your true authority? At the end of the day, somebody gets a final take. Somebody is, somebody is saying something or an author that is influencing how you're thinking about your life, your calling, your hopes, your dreams, your longings. And we think in Christianity that God's word is enough, that he is our final authority, that his words are, are true. Um, <clears throat> as you think about that um, in your own life, I wonder if, if we might take just a moment or two to allow you guys to reflect about your own life. 
where are the places for you that other voices, frankly, are just more weighty and more meaningful than God's word? What are the other voices that are your final authority at times? Take a moment or two to reflect on that, and then I'll I'll invite some of you to share. What is it for you? What are some of the other authorities that are weightier than God's word for you? Yes. What does that look like practically? Because if he really cared, he would, he would do this. Yeah, so true. Good. What else? That's a good answer, man. Good answer. That's the best answer. <laughs> it's like your heroin, right? Yeah, that's good. How about you? I ask you guys that question because the only thing that you have to offer your students is yourselves with the scriptures. Like, we have to lead with our weakness and our brokenness and our, and like your students, my students desperately need, need to see me needing Jesus. That I am, I, I am a mess without Jesus. I cannot do it without his scriptures. Um, I relate to a lot, a number of the examples you gave. When when we were starting RUF at Trinity, we had three students, and and so we were each week kind of teeter-tottering between being a small group Bible study and then being a large group meeting, and I never really realized that my drive to be legit and to prove myself in ministry and to show everyone that I was worth it and that I am called into ministry and, you know, all that was wrapped up into the numbers and the success of the ministry. Um, kind of a funny story. Um, one week in particular, our, our, our numbers went way down. And it was midterms. I think there was a bunch of other activities going on. But I, I mean, I mean, it was a really small turnout. And after that RUF meeting, on my way home from work, I pulled over into a Domino's parking lot and I ordered myself a large pizza and I sat in my car in the parking lot and just pounded it and just crushed it by myself. What was I doing there? I was numbing myself. I mean, it was my heroin. It was my porn, right? That's what it was. Because something deep and profound in my heart and my soul, a longing for affirmation, a longing to be legit, was not being satisfied. And I thought, this is going to hopefully make, make things better. But at that moment, Jesus' approval of me, or my Father's approval of me through the work of Jesus, frankly, was just not enough. I needed the approval of 18 to 21-year-olds saying that I was awesome. 
And the way they can show me that is by showing up to my stinking meeting. <laughs> right? Does that sound familiar at all? Am I the only one? Um, and so this is a critical question. This is, this is a foundational question. As you're sitting down and you're looking into the eyes of, of this seventh grade girl, she may not articulate it this way, but something's driving her. What is it? What is it going to look like for you to persuade her of the scriptures and God's word? Justification. Justification, when you strip it down and, and translate it into layman's terms, is really getting at this simple question. What really makes me okay? And I've already t tipped my hand a little bit, if you will, with that illustration with the large pizza in the Domino's parking lot. Like, Jesus' approval of me in God's courtroom was not enough. I, I was not okay with 10 people being at my campus ministry. Like, I, I, was, in, I was undone because my I identity, my sense of self-worth, my sense of value was completely bound up in ministry success. I'm a failure. I'm a loser because I don't have X number of students coming to that Bible study. That is a justification issue. And when we're talking about justification, though that's a big fancy word, one of the classic places that we see that is in Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 26. Paul writes, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and notice this, and are justified by his grace as a gift. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation or atoning sacrifice by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Justification by grace through faith is foundational for whether a student in your ministry has become a Christian. Justification is preoccupied with the objective guilt that every human being has before a holy God. Not our guilty feelings, but the objective sense of guilt before a holy God that demands perfection. And when we, we talk about perfection, we don't just mean that the kid in high school, like, Oh, he didn't sleep with his girlfriend, so he's good. It means that he also has to love perfectly. Perfection meaning that we avoid the things that God calls us to avoid, and we 100% do all of the things that he's commanded us to do. Love God and love your neighbor. Perfect righteousness, perfect love, constantly self-giving, 24-7, obedience to the law. That is the heart of the law is love God and love others. And we have a problem. None of us have done it. There's not one person. We have a righteousness problem. And therefore, justification is God's solution to this gap in our relationship, this chasm. And Jesus comes, and of course, I'll start with the part that's most familiar to us, Jesus comes and dies on the cross for our sins. And he bears the wrath of God. God's judgment is poured out on Jesus in our place. He gets punished in our place. 
he receives what we should have received fully. And so now the wrath of God is satisfied. Typically in the Old Testament, there's, there's a picture, there's two cups. There's the cup of blessing, and then there's the cup of God's wrath. Those, um, there are covenant curses and there are covenant blessings. And if we could follow the metaphor on the cross of Calvary, Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath and judgment down to the dregs in our place. There's, uh, as I like to do with students, I will actually hold up a cup and shake it upside down and say, there's nothing left in here for you to drink. Jesus has drank it, drunk it, drank it, I always stunk at that. (laughs) Drank it, drunk it, down to the dregs. Why are you going back to that cup and trying to beat yourself up, shame yourself, condemn yourself? Jesus has already paid fully. That's good news, right? Most people in your youth group are like, yeah, yeah, I get that. But that's not fully justification. What are we missing? Yes, yes, full forgiveness and also full righteousness. Jesus not only takes what we deserve, guess what? He gives us what he deserves. His life of love and righteousness, his perfect resume, as I like to use with students, is now ours for those that are trusting in Jesus. Like, there's a great exchange. He receives our punishment, and we receive his perfect life of righteousness. I love this illustration. It means a lot to me. If you've heard it a million times, I apologize. Um, Imagine that you are $2 million in debt. You are really, really in bad shape. You've squandered your, you know, you, you, you bought a lot of stuff on your credit card. Who knows, right? There's no way you can pay back $2 million. If you work 24 hours a day to the day you die, there's no way you can do it. Thankfully, you get a call from a guy at a bank. He's the owner of the bank, the head of the bank, and he goes, Justin, I've got great news. A benefactor has stepped forward, and he has fully forgiven your debt of $2 million. Like, you don't have to pay it. You're good. It's it's gone. Would you be excited? I would be overjoyed because I know there's no way I could pay this thing back. And too often, that's where justification stops for most of us. I'm forgiven, yes, and that's good news. But then 20 minutes later, after you've come down from your high, you realize, oh crap, how much is in my checking account right now? How much is it? Zero. Zero. 20 minutes later, another benefactor calls and says, I want to put $3 million in your, in your checking account. It's yours. You didn't do anything to deserve it. I just want to give it to you. That is justification. The debt is fully paid, and we receive the pure, amazing, powerful righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that now, what that looks like is that our Heavenly Father when he looks at us in his courtroom, he's hammered the gavel and he has said, not guilty. He was punished in your place. We don't believe in double jeopardy where you're punished again for the same crime. You have, it has been punished, it has been pay, he has been paid, it has been paid in full and now you are wearing his robes of righteousness. And he, You handed to him, or he took off of you, your stinky, nasty, disgusting robes that, that, it's our life. And I, you know, use your imagination. That robe has all kinds of stuff on it. And Jesus says, let me, let me take that for you. And he puts it on himself on the cross of Calvary, and he bears the wrath of God. And then he gives you these clean, pure, bright, radiant robes of his perfect love, of him loving that woman at the well in John 4, him raising Lazarus in John 11 and weeping with his dear friends. It was as if you were there doing that. 
That's how righteous we are before the Father. You are wearing his robes of righteousness. And I think it was Spurgeon that once said, if there was one stitch in that garment that is a defect or off, then we would all be undone. But it's perfect. It's righteous and it's radiant. Do you believe, as you're sitting in this amazing place, that your heavenly Father right now, no matter whether your ministry is blowing up or shrinking, whether you're brand new and you don't know what you're doing or you've been a veteran, that your Father sees you right now with those robes of righteousness. Do you believe that? What are the barriers this morning or this afternoon to, to believing that? How is that too good to be true? Because this is justification. How is it too good to be true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. <laughs> that is a very good sort of pedagogical little bone you tossed to me right there. But I want us actually to, instead of moving on to sanctification, I want you to think about your own hearts. Where are the places? Because guys... The thing that we're bringing to the students is that we're wrestling and struggling with our own justification as well. That we're battling, that we're struggling. Because all we're doing, what Jesus is teaching us, is hopefully just bubbling out and overflowing into the hearts and lives of the students. Right? I think it was Francis Schaeffer that once said, one of the greatest evils or perils in ministry is to do ministry out of the flesh. To do ministry based upon your personality, your giftedness, your talents, rather than in the supernatural resurrection power of Jesus. So that's why, let's pause and ask ourselves personally right now, are you believing that that gospel of justification is true of you right now? Why is that hard to get a, our hearts and our minds around at times? Yes, sir. Thank you. It's probably, it's probably what, what he'd be looking for. That's what our lives are all about. Everything is grace. Like when we have been forgiven of that debt and we receive the, the righteousness of Christ, our lives are nothing more than a gigantic thank you. Thank you for everything you've done and how we treat people, how we serve people, how we love people. What are the, what are the other battles, what are the other struggles with justification that are in your heart? Yeah. Right. If, if it's crazy. Right. It's crazy. Totally.
Yes. Anybody else want to share? wrote this on the board. This is how I live my life, high school, college, and then my life has changed in seminary. I'm, I believed it was all grace. Saved by grace, kept by my efforts. Saved by grace, kept by my efforts. Now, we believe, in a minute, I'm going to talk about sanctification. You better believe your effort matters. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who is at work, Right? You work out, imperative. You do it, but God is the one who is at work. So we're not saying that effort doesn't, is not a part of the equation, but I was living my life, when I was putting my head on the pillow, I was asking myself, did I share the gospel enough today to justify being like a good Christian? Did I have, was my quiet time fervent and genuine enough? Have I done enough for God? And guys, that's, that's just slavery, right? This is not justification. Saved by grace, kept by your efforts. You are saved by grace, you are rescued by grace, you are kept by grace, you are sanctified by grace, you are conformed to the image of Christ by grace, you will be glorified by grace. Um, yes, so that's justification. Can I give you guys a couple of, I'm going to just rattle off a couple of application questions that you might want to explore uh, later on as it relates to justification. How might full forgiveness, fully declared righteous in God's courtroom, change how you are viewing your marriage or your romantic relationship? How might it change how you're viewing your children, if you have children, or your parents? How might justification even change how you're viewing your own body? I spend a lot of time talking with my students about body image dynamics. And many students long to get in somebody else's skin because they despise the skin that they're in. Um, some students, it's not body image. It's uh, intellectual abilities or social abilities. And they're just saying, oh, but this is just not enough. Do you see that that ultimately is a justification issue? What's going to really make me okay, Justin, is if I look like this. What's going to really give me joy and meaning and satisfaction is if I just had these kind of social abilities. How might justification change how you view your neighbor in your neighborhood? How might justification change how you're viewing your work currently right now? Like, are you really working so hard because you want to hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant? Or are you really working so hard to define your sense of value and to fi find a sense of self-worth? How might justification apply to your struggles, your battles with anger or even anxiety? How might your belief in justification shape and change the harshness and the defensiveness that is characterizing how you're relating to your roommates or a spouse? These are just some questions that came off, off the top of my head. If there's anything that will make us humble, if there's anything that will make us compassionate, toward people and to really hang in there long with those kids that need a lot of extra attention, it's going back to justification, right? Because we realize we don't have a leg to stand on. That it's all the work of, of God. Yeah.
Yeah, no. Um, what, his question, for those of you who um, didn't hear it, he said, so it's going to be a continual battle to actually believe in our justification. How are we going to communicate that to kids? I actually think that's, what we, that's what the precise thing we need to communicate to kids. That, um, that, that, it, that, it, that it is a struggle and a battle and that, the, that where we go awry in the Christian life is running away from the freedom and the relationship we do have in Christ and running to other places and sources for joy. That we never sort of get to this point where, um, you know, we've, we've kind of arrived. That we're, we're constantly needing to be reminded of that and, you know, being defined by that work. Well, yeah. Sure. And, and it's so it's so helpful, and it's such a great reminder that um, justification is a one-time act of God. He has acted on our behalf, whether we're <laughs> fully grasped the magnitude of that or not. And even though we're a new, we are a new creation. Even though we have been definitively sanctified and set set apart from the um, the slavery to sin we still have this sense of wanting to justify ourselves by being smart, by having the successful ministry, by being defensive when we're having a conflict with a, a spouse or a friend. And all of those are ways that in our heart, not intellectually, intellectually we get it, but in our hearts, our heart constantly wants to justify ourselves instead of the work of God. This is a perfect time to take a break. How about, can you guys come back in uh, 10 minutes? I'm going to start right at 4.10.
I'm going to shoot to wrap things up at 4.50 so that you, if you guys want to ask questions from 4.50 to 5, um, we'll do that. So just that, that's where I'm going to be, where I'm going to be heading. And um, so, <clears throat> you know, we can, we're continuing to talk about our, our principles that are the rocket fuel that drive um, ministry. Again, that doesn't mean that we don't talk about other things in the Bible. We need to talk about other things in the Bible, but we're really going to make sure that we don't miss these four things. Bullseyes, right? Um, <clears throat> justification is pretty awesome. I think everyone was pretty stoked as we were talking about that, and we should be stoked. Too often, when we talk about the gospel, that's all people talk about, though. Justification is incredible. Justification is the answer to our guilt before a holy God. But justification isn't saying anything about our internal nastiness and our twistedness and our corruption and our perversion and our <clears throat> hungers and desires that are not in line with God's character. Sanctification is God's answer to that. Sanctification is focused on the corruption where God is dead set. He is willing to give up his own son to make us holy, to conform us, to shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. In God's courtroom, justification, the gavel's been hammered, not guilty. Jesus was punished in your place. You receive his righteousness. In sanctification, our internal lives, our character, our longings and our desires are systematically being realigned and, and recalibrated in a way that is in line with God's aims and God's desires, namely his kingdom, his holiness, his power, and his desire to see the world resound with his glory. Man, apart from the gospel, want the world to resound with their glory. So sanctification, again, is talking about change, growth, looking more and more like Jesus. Not just behavior change. Behavior change is, is certainly a part of it. But as we all know, change first has to start in the heart. Yeah, we're good. Thanks, Joey. Um, so, as we talk about sanctification, it's really important. Remember, remember um, well, I'll, I'll say this. <clears throat> Paul uses a phrase throughout his letters that is all over the place. In fact, you see it so much, you don't even think anything of it. It's in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, to the point where it's almost like, okay, we get the idea. Paul is doing that for a reason. He is saying that is that like the life of the Christian is lived connected to Jesus Christ. He is the head, we are his body. Everything that we have for life and godliness is only ours through Jesus, through our vital communion. Theologians call it union with Christ. Now, why am I talking to you about this? Because for us to understand the rich truths in theology, we need to understand that that bond of being connected to Jesus, union with Christ, is like the only way that we receive these benefits of redemption. There's no way. Think about it this way. It's like, um, every illustration breaks down, so don't, don't throw a book at me, but it's almost like taking a plug-in, like, like, like an iPhone charger, and plugging it into the power source. We have no power unless we're connected vitally in union with Jesus Christ, with his resurrection power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead empowers us to fight against sin and to say yes to righteousness, okay? But you don't have that power on your own. Only as we are united objectively in the work of Jesus. And these are just a, a list off the top of my head of, of these benefits that are ours in Christ. Regeneration, meaning that we were once dead in our sins and trespasses, and he put those, those paddles on our chest. I don't know what those, the proper term is. And you go, doof, doof, and then we're alive. Paddles, yeah, there you go. Not ping pong paddles, that's something different. 
Regeneration, we, are, we once were dead, now we're alive. Justification, I've already mentioned that, right? That also is, a, is ours via union with Christ. Declared righteous, or excuse me, fully forgiven and declared righteous. Sanctification is what we're going to be talking about. Sanctification begins with what is known as definitive sanctification. In definitive sanctification... Maybe an illustration to think of is before we walked around with chains, we're a slave to sin. And in definitive sanctification, the Holy Spirit comes in with gigantic bolt cutters and you're free. Your heart is free. You are free to serve. You're no longer commanded to obey those old masters. I just finished preaching through Exodus. Such an amazing picture of how these Egyptians... They were in hot pursuit after God's people. And the Israelites had been radically rescued, right? Pretty amazing. Passover, that was pretty crazy. They're free. They're in the wilderness. But they're like, I just wish I could go back to Egypt. I just wish I could eat at the, at the table the, you know, with all their delicious food and all this stuff. They wish they could go back to slavery. But they had been set free. They were already free. So, definitive sanctification means that in Christ, we have been set free. We have, are free to fight. <clears throat> Theologians, historians, then use the second definition of sanctification. As, as we have, are now set free, we have, set, we have been now, we are, have now set off on a course of progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification basically means for the rest of your life, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is dead set and committed to making you look like Jesus Christ. He wants to conform you, he will conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. That certainly includes our efforts. We certainly play a part in that. It doesn't just sort of like, you know, happen automatically. I tell my students all the time, sanctification is guaranteed, but it is not automatic. Sanctification is guaranteed, but it is not automatic. It's guaranteed because it was purchased through the work of God. It is applied to us by the Holy Spirit, but it is not automatic because it involves our efforts. It involves us dying to sin and living to Christ. No one in this life ever will be fully sanctified. No one. Sanctification will involve your entire life. Dying to sin and living unto Christ. Sanctification, this, specifically this progressive sanctification, which is all grace, but includes our efforts, includes our, our discipline, is really getting at this question, can I grow? Can I really change? And you have students in your youth group right now that may not be articulating that question, but that is in their heart. You've got an 11th grader that is battling pornography who says, I love Jesus. I want to follow him. You say that we are free. I don't feel like I'm free at all. I feel owned by this. Can you help me, please? Sanctification. That's what that student needs to hear about. The Holy Spirit is committing to making you look like Jesus. A couple of verses. Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. This, this language of consider yourselves dead to sin is, is significant. Because earlier Paul says you are dead. You already are dead to sin. So therefore, live like it. 
Consider yourself dead to sin. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. Kind of picking it up midstream here. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have learned about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Sanctification is a work of God's free grace. He is working his grace into our lives. And we are renewed over time in the whole man after the image of God. And we are enabled by the power of the Spirit to die to sin and live unto Christ. That's the Westminster Confession of Faith uh, catechism answer. And it's very helpful and very concise. Because it includes both of those components of the definitive as well as the progressive. Sanctification is one of our principles. Getting at the question of can I really grow and can I really change means that as you are preparing your lesson, as you're thinking about your applications, that you're weaving together a question like that in your preparations. You're anticipating that that's on the forefront of one of your students' minds. I mean, I just feel so owned by my sin and my shame. Can I really grow? Can I really change? Or what if I'm not growing fast enough? How do I really practically meet with God and, and participate in those means of grace of Scripture and prayer and the sacraments, communion and, the Lord's, and uh, baptism? As you're thinking about your one-on-one -on -one meetings with a student, as you're entering in thoughtfully with that student, as you're getting to know their story, as you're beginning to, to hear their challenges, their struggles, I have a suspicion that there, there, will be some, there will be other questions, but probably one or two of these questions is going to be popping up. What is the real issue that's keeping them up at night? Is it a justification issue? Is it a student who does love Jesus, that is a Christian, but is really misunderstanding sanctification maybe they're on one end being like wait i thought it was all grace so i don't have to do anything and they're surprised that they're, that that their affections are cold they're surprised that they're lazy they're surprised they don't care because they're not communing with jesus they're not meeting with him in all the places that he promises to meet the word and prayer or maybe it's a student who's on the opposite side of the equation kind of like i was in college um, this student is thinking that all of sanctification and the success of that rests on her little seventh grade shoulders. And she has to get all her ducks in a row. And she better check off every blank in sanctification. And she needs to be reminded that God is the one who is at work. That sanctification is a work of God's free grace. As you're thinking about students that are wrestling with or considering Christianity, specifically the area of sanctification, what do you think are some examples from your own ministry? Don't want to give any real names here, but to make this concrete, what are some of the, the questions as it relates to sanctification that your students really struggle with, that are battling? Who wants to share? Yeah, in the back. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Who else? One of you guys? Yeah. Yeah. And not bored, but can I really be sanctified to the point where I'm experiencing true joy? Yes. Yeah, it, it feels just abstract, esoteric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have something? Yeah, in the meantime, I'm going to have a good time. So it's easy for you. Yeah. You've kind of figured it out, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a student who a couple years ago, her father's not a believer, and, and they were getting a divorce, and told her, you know, you're not going to be able to be a good wife because of the marriage that you've seen, whether or not, like, just some destructive stuff you told her. And so I was talking to her about it one day, and I remember I said something along the lines of, if I'm an adoption, like, you understand you're not just a victim. Yeah, let me, uh, I, I want to move on just for the sake of time for us. Um, I think that one of the, the challenges that we have as we talk about sanctification with students, and maybe even in our own lives, is that perhaps we think about sanctification more like an escalator, where it's like, I should be getting better each day, like, I should know, I, I should just be a better person, and it should be obvious. And um, I, I'm sure many of us have realized that's just not, that's not the way sanctification works. Like the real way that sanctification works is by bringing us down and by showing us, in the words of the hymn writer, the hidden evils of our heart so that we might repent of the, our self-righteousness, our self-protection, our self-promotion, our insecurities, our hatred of others as Christians and, 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 and like that, that's called mortification, dying to sin, killing sin, and then running to the arms of Jesus, running to our God, and claiming those gospel promises for ourselves. Repentance and faith are a critical component in the Christian life. And I honestly find with young people, they're shocked when I tell them that. They're like, no, like I've become a Christian, like things should just get better. Like I'm reading my Bible, I'm plugging it in the formula. It's like, well, how's your repentance? And they're like, well, I repented like when I, when I became a Christian. The mark of a, a Christian maturity is constant repentance. Is constantly saying, I need Jesus. That um, I told the second year crew, I said, you know, maybe it might be helpful for us 
to see that we're the biggest problem with the youth group. We are the biggest sinners in the room. And that we are in the most desperate need of Jesus. And when your students, when my students see me needing Jesus like that, guess what? I become invisible. And Jesus becomes beautiful and magnetic and irresistible. Right? Repentance and faith in my life, just kind of one component of sanctification, larger conversation, the way that's felt for me subjectively, day in and day out, this little chart that somebody came up with a long time ago has been very helpful for me. If we think about this little tiny cross as like the day that Justin became a Christian, whatever that was, a long time ago, um, my sort of understanding of, of Christian growth is that, like I was saying, you just kind of plug everything in and you push, you push enter on the equation and out pops maturity. And, um, but honestly, as I was living my Christian life, how about I try a different color real quick? For emphasis. I'm being very dramatic, it's red. It's pretty dramatic, right? Um, and as I'm growing in my Christian life, I really don't r talk much about God's holiness anymore and how much he still demands of me, even as a Christian. Like he's called me to follow him. My heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? I don't really talk much about that. I talk a lot about what I'm doing and how much I'm accomplishing. And my sin, uh, I don't really want to talk about that that much anymore. Why, why do I need to do that? It's already been paid for. Failing to see that while my sin, the penalty of my sin has been paid for, the quality of my fellowship with my heavenly father is squelched and suppressed by my blatant disobedience. That's right. Our disobedience in the life of a Christian grieves the Holy Spirit, right? Ephesians 5. And so guess what happened over time? Cross kind of wasn't getting very big, is it? Because I wasn't making much of God's holiness and I wasn't being honest about my own sin. And I was surprised that my repentance was so surfacy. But instead, this has uh, been something that's true for me. When I begin to look at God's holiness and the reality of how I really live my life as a minister... And I realize I don't even come close. Yes, I'm a new creation in Christ. Yes, 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 I believe all that. But when I look at the law's demands and I'm like, I am not the husband I should be. I'm not the minister that I should be. I'm not the father that I should be. I want to. Romans 7, right? I do the things I don't want to do. Why do I not do the things that I know I want to do? And then also my sin, when I stop defending myself, stop making excuses, stop being the victim and say, I've got to own up to the fact that I was being insecure. I was being, I was being arrogant. Yes, I know he said that to me. Yes, I know he provoked me, but I got to own this stuff. When both of those two things come together, God's crazy high holiness and the seriousness of my sin on the ground in real life, look what happens over time. What happens? Why does the cross get bigger? Subjectively speaking, in your own sort of experience and your affections, why is the cross getting bigger, do you think? You realize you need Jesus more and more and more and more. Yeah. Yeah. Does that resonate with anyone? You cannot do the things that you have been called to do in ministry. You can't do it. What God has called you to do is something supernatural that only the resurrected Jesus Christ can accomplish. And through his Holy Spirit, because you are united to Jesus, he will use you as a vessel. Why do we, why do we trust in our personality and our skills and our gifts? Why are we insecure? Because we get in the way. We think we can do it on our own. Americans, American Christianity, we are so focused on our competency and our skills and our ability when what God has called us to do is utterly supernatural. 
This will lead us to repentance. Ask your spouse, ask, ask your spouse to ask you. Ask the, the girl or the guy that you're dating, ask your roommates, ask your children to say, I need you to ask daddy, how is his repentance? When we are repentant, our hearts are moldable and soft and, and willing to be corrected. We're bold because we are trusting, not in our abilities, but trusting in him. I'm convinced that faith and repentance are the critical components that mortification and the vivification, dying to sin and living unto Christ, to our sanctification. It's not an escalator. It's more like this. And we hate that as Americans. We hate feeling needy, and yet this is the heart of sanctification. I wish I could keep going on that. But let's talk about glorification for a moment. If you have questions, write it down and we'll, we'll catch it at the end. Glorification is something that all of us are longing for and waiting for when Jesus comes back. I already mentioned to you that sanctification, no one will ever be fully sanctified in this life. But the moment that you die as a Christian and you stand before Jesus, you will be fully righteous. But there's a day coming when Jesus comes back again and we will receive resurrection bodies like his. And we will reign and rule with him in a resurrected creation, the new heavens and the new earth. I want to share something with you real quick. I'll write fast. There are multiple sides and variables or angles to the reality of sin in the world. There's the penalty of sin. There's the power of sin. And then there's the presence of sin. Justification is God's answer. It's a terrible J. Penalty of sin has been paid for in justification. You bear it no more. The power of sin is dealing with the specific side of definitive sanctification. You are no longer a slave to sin. Sin no longer has ultimate slave master power over you. Well, Justin, but I, I run back to the garbage heap. I, I run back to that, those old ways. Yeah, 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 I get that. I get that. It's called indwelling sin. And that's a battle for all of us, the flesh and the spirit. Romans 7, Romans 8, we're always in that war, that battleground in our hearts. But before you knew Jesus, you were a slave to sin. But now the power of sin has been broken in definitive sanctification. Friends, we are still waiting for this guy right here. Because even though we are being sanctified, even though we are being more and more conformed into the image of Jesus Christ and the fruit of the Spirit are growing in our lives by, the, by God's grace, we still live in a world that has been tainted and corrupted and twisted by sin. It's broken. Marriages fall apart. Communities, institutions, right? I don't have to tell you this. You know this. But there's a day coming where we will live in a world without even the presence of sin, where sin has not tainted, corrupted anything. We can't even fathom what that would be like. But that's what glorification is all about. Does my life here really matter? Does my calling really matter? Does my job and my talents and my gifts, can God really use all of those things? Yes, God cares about those things so much. He's coming back and he's restoring his creation. He's giving us a resurrection body just like his glorified body himself. That is ours because of union with Christ. The presence of sin will be gone and glorification. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 9 and 1 Corinthians 15 are a couple of passages that I think are helpful um, in that regard. 
Revelation 21 is a great passage that describes when Jesus comes again, this new heaven and this new earth. Where it's not like this earth that we see here is going to be thrown in the trash can and he's going to push reset and, and like manufacture a brand new one. I don't know how this works, but it's more like everything that's broken and corrupted in this world it's like the sin and the brokenness and the shame will be pulled and, and I, don't, I don't know how this works, but we will have a resurrected creation. And your final resting place, my final resting place is not in heaven with angel wings and a harp wearing like one of those little cute little loincloths. Our final resting place, friends, for those of us that are in Christ, when Jesus comes back in glory is with physical bodies in a physical place, a new heaven and a new earth where every tear will be wiped from our eyes. No more death, no more sadness, no more sorrow. How many people in your youth group right now need to hear that? That future hope of glory that's just as sure and just as true as the very next day. That Jesus purchased that for us. That we will reign and rule with him. That his, his, um, his immediate, his original plans from Genesis 1 and 2, for us to be vice regents, to fill the earth with God's glory, to be fruitful and multiply, exercising dominion, to spread God's glory as living, breathing image bearers of his glory all over the earth, to make the entire created order beautiful like Eden, that those original marching orders from Genesis 1 and 2 will still be fulfilled. The new heaven and the new earth. No sin, no sorrow, no shame. Just complete love, complete glory before Jesus. I can't wait. How might that be an encouragement? to the kids in your youth group or to you. Absolutely. As far as the curse is found. That's my favorite lyric for, of an Advent hymn. Like, that's how far the work of Jesus goes. And the curse jacked everything up. As far as the curse is found, that's how far God's work goes. How is it encouraging to you? Absolutely. The hope of the resurrected Christ. What questions can I answer for you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a privilege. Sure. I think a lot of it has to do with the emphasis, particularly... Um, 
in the scriptures and the Westminster Confession of Faith as it relates to sin. Particularly, as I mentioned earlier, the penalty and the power and the presence of sin. Like, things like um, regeneration, adoption, kingdom of God, all of those things are, are going to be talked about and mentioned, but it is critical for our students to understand Scripture and that the only way they can be right with God is through the work of Jesus. And the tension between our obedience and the work of God and sanctification and the ultimate place of where all sanctification is going, which is glory. So... Again, it might be helpful just to think about it in terms of what we're aiming for in a bullseye. We don't hit the bullseye every time, but we're aiming for that. So that means over a four-year period, you have a game plan. You, this helps shape how your curriculum, you know, what you want to accomplish over a four-year so the student gets a full-orbed, whole counsel of God, biblical experience. Think about them as handles, not like the only four things you're allowed to talk about. It's just these are the four things you can't miss. Yeah, another. Sure, no problem. That's so helpful just to have like, oh yeah, we can't talk about everything. We have to be our focus. So I'm totally buying into that. But just like starting with sin as like sort of like the the problem we're addressing makes me anxious because I want to start with creation. Mm. That's the the story of the Bible. That's the flow. I'm going to come to seminary. That's all I talk about. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. I get it. That's a, no, I appreciate that opportunity to explain. Um, I'm with you on the biblical storyline, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. This is, I haven't told you how to communicate the principles. I've just told you this is the stuff that needs to be communicated. How to do it takes skill. It takes uh, paying closely, close attention to your demographics, individual, all the stuff that Buck went over, kind of threw, threw at you pretty quickly. Um, you better believe it. There's not, a, there's not a sermon that goes by that I don't preach where I first begin with creation. Because that's where the Bible begins. So this, this is not so much like a pedagogy of me saying everything starts with sin because that wouldn't be accurate. Um, I'm simply trying to answer the question of our fundamental problem is sin. And so, therefore, um, this is the Bible's answer to it. So, other questions? Yes. Yeah. Like, and just keeps acting like they did, they weren't wrong. Like nothing smells worse to us than that. And, and and so and so practically people are ruining their relationships around them and not even doing it sometimes because they don't realize that sin is an ongoing struggle. And so it's hmm. sort of like, no, that was back then and, 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 and you know, if I if I step on your toes, it's like, you know, it's an accident, but it's not sin, you know. And so they kind of separate themselves from the realities that are, you know, prohibiting them from actually Absolutely. I, lo- I love to hear that. You know, one of the illustrations that I like to use when I introduce a confession of sin at church, because it is like a similar reaction, like, what's up with this? Like, is this like morbid introspection? And I, I use the illustration of like, let's just be honest, throughout this week, a whole lot of trash has been building up in our houses. And confession of sin is taking out the trash. It's getting in the way. We're trying to have fellowship in the household of God and all this junk in here is here. And and we can say, oh, no, there's nothing in here. We're good. No, we're fine. But you and I both know there's trash in here that we got to take out. That's all confession is. You're saying, I'm going to own this. I'm going to name this. I'm going to take this junk and I'm going to bring it to Jesus. Confess my sin and, and respond with faith. Mm-hmm. 
we can talk about it. It's just that. Yeah. And uh, I'm expecting something juicy and big, and, and she wants to know, how do I love my neighbor or friend when I've been really hurt by them? Hmm. And I was like, I, I was slightly disappointed, thinking I'm going to get some, like, you know, big, hmm. like, homosexuality issue to really dig into, and let's really, yeah, this is what I got. And and I, it, it, it turned out beautiful. It was, hmm. it was a it caused me to really introspect and get into this, into the word, and and pull out stuff for her. And um, what what I'm struck with, I guess, is what I want to say is how um, we, how how little Christians really know how to walk through, how to truly repent, and mm. how to like to say I'm sorry. Mm. This is not it when you're really crushed by someone. Mm-hmm. And Oh, that's great. That's beautiful. And uh, you, as you were sharing, I was reminded of a book. It's available on the book table. Um, I, I highly recommend all of you to pick it up. It's called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hand. Um, and it's by Paul Tripp and Tim Lane. And I, I'll just warn you, it, it, these are, these are, it's written primarily for Christian counselors to help them know how to enter into people's lives. So it's not written directly for youth workers. I think you will find a lot of his principles, their principles, transferable to your context. You may have to kind of do a little probing and thinking. That book has really helped me do exactly what you're talking about. Helping students wade into the lives of others with grace and truth and, and humility and to actually enter in. And um, it's hard and it's a great book. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. So you said, uh, <clears throat> sure. But is it the top of the pile were like methods, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. Yeah. No, thank you for reminding me. Um, Yes, there are. Um, I really enjoy this book by Paul Tripp called Dangerous Calling. I think this might be available on the book table as well. It's called Confronting the Unique Challenges of Pastoral Ministry. And um, I think you'll find a lot of things that he's saying are reinforcing some of the things that, that we've been talking about during this time. Um, there's another book. Uh, some of this is I'm really big into um, soul care. I don't, I don't know if that's a buzzword in y'all circles, but soul care basically just means that you're making sure that you're putting your oxygen mask on first before you attempt to put an oxygen mask on somebody else. And you're working through your junk and your issues and what you're bringing to people is out of overflow of what you've already received. I've been really influenced by a book called The Emotionally Healthy Church by uh, Pete Scazzaro. I'm sure I'm butchering his last name. Scazzaro, Scazzaro, S-C-A-Z-Z-E-R-O. We'll try that. Pete Scazzaro, Emotionally Healthy Church. He has like various spins on it, the emotionally healthy child, the emotionally healthy um, uh, spirituality, discipleship, yeah. So he's obviously franchised his, his model here, but just, Emotionally Healthy Church has been very helpful for me. Oh, another book that just hit me. Buy this book. Buy this. This changed my wife's, uh, the life of my wife. Um, 
It's called On the Brink. On the Brink by Clay Werner. W-E-R-N-E-R. A little bit of backstory. My wife really battled, um, was in kind of a dark night of the soul with depression and, and anxiety last year. Very heavy, very dark, very serious. We walked through that together, and this book was a great help for her. She handed it to me and said, I know that Clay wrote this for pastors, but how he's thinking about ministry is exactly how I'm struggling with our family and our children. And Clay wrote this. He's now a church planner in Athens, Georgia, where I serve. He wrote this as one who went through pastoral burnout. And this group here, this time here, is to help immunize you from burnout. Um, Those are a couple of books that come to mind. Um, In the Name of Jesus by Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen was a Catholic priest. He is very wise. He was very wise and discerning. That book really helps me think about ministry leadership. And let me see if I have a couple of others. Give me one second, okay? Does that help? Great. I've got time for one more question. No more questions? All right, then I'm going to close with some prayer if that's cool with y'all. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your spirit to dwell with us during this time. I pray that um, before we think about how to apply this material and these truths to junior high and high school students, I pray first that we would apply it to our own heart, that we would do some heart surgery on ourselves. What really drives us in ministry? Whose glory are we after? Do we really believe that you are for us even if we fail in ministry? Lord, please pour your truths into our hearts that we might overflow into the lives of your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks a lot.